This morning I'm talking with Dr. Richard Boyatzis of the Weatherhead School of Management. We're interviewing faculty and emeriti to collect the stories because the faculty here in the Organizational Behavior Department are some of the seminal thinkers in the field. So good morning, Dr. Boyatzis. Good morning, Laura. Um, in each of our lives, there are special times when we inevitably know or intuitively know that we've made the right choices, the right life choices, the right career choices, moments when we know that our work is going to have impact and meaning. Mm -hmm. um, and that will be contributing to others. Those are the things I'd like to talk to you about today. Um, I'd like to start um, um, with um, asking you, how did you how did you come into the field of organizational behavior? Is this where you started? Is it? No, it's definitely not where I started, and it was kind of a backwards way. I, I sorry to have to go back this far, but uh, I grew up in uh, in Queens and Sunnyside in a working class neighborhood. My father was a waiter, <clears throat> so I was going to PS one fifty up through fourth grade, and three times they tried to lead me back because they classified me as cognitively slow. I spoke Greek before I spoke English. I, I did speak English in the in kindergarten and first grade. I had a bit of a Greek accent. And um, in, the, in, in the late 40s, early 50s, that was not seen as a sign of brightness. But there was all sorts of other weird things going on. And my mother used to fight for me to stay in grade and homeschool me till I caught up. and tell me to be careful about all these, you know, foreigners, you know, and p dangerous people who would uh, seek to put you down. So all of a sudden, we, my father decides we need a little more of a healthy environment. So we move out to East Meadow on Long Island, which at the time was a working class community, a few middle class folks. And <clears throat> I get retested within a year, and they tell my mother that, I'm really, really smart, and I should be in this advanced program, which in the early 50s, or in the mid 50s, rather, was probably the precursor to the current AP programs in schools. So all of a sudden, I find myself being told that I'm really good in math and physics, which I was always pretty geeky, but nobody ever labeled it. I would say somewhere around 9 or 10 is when I got enthralled with the space, the whole idea of going into space and being in space. Um, <clears throat> concepts about space travel. So from the time I was 9 or 10, I knew what I wanted to do with my life, which was be in the space program. Flash forward, I get into MIT, and I'm studying aeronautics and astronautics. My junior year, I run out of money. The Institute gets me an internship that's paid for a company doing aerospace research. And I'm out there at Northrop NORAIR, NORAIR and discovering that the day-to-day -day work is boring. Mm. I, I couldn't go into space because my eyes. And in those days, you had to have perfect vision, naturally. And there was no surgery. <clears throat> so, I mean, for example, I mean, I spent two weeks of my life putting 900 points of data, which I generated on a, on a computer program, because we were trying to look at re-entry, uh, the design of re-entry vehicles that would go into space what eventually became the space shuttle. Right. But in 66, we didn't have that yet. And I spent two weeks of my life putting these 900 data points on a piece of 17 inch by 11 inch piece of graph paper and connecting the dots. Uh, and I just decided that's not the way I wanted to live my life. So we're going back to MIT. I have two courses to finish. I'm too compulsive not to. So I say, well, what am I going to do? I don't want to do this. My other two. Um, classmates who went with me stayed in engineering. Um, I didn't want to go in restaurants. I'd done it a few summers. Every male that I knew on this side of the Atlantic and my extended family, which were most of the adult males that I knew, were in the restaurant business. I didn't want to do that. So I thought to me, I said, I know. I'll go into management. It's got to be easy. Look at these idiots we had at Northrop. <clears throat> so, um, I, I go over to the Sloan School at MIT, and they have this thing where the new professor, not new, the professors who were teaching courses with no prerequisites would each desi uh, describe their course in, you know, 10 minutes. And one young professor got up, who actually was still finishing his PhD at Harvard, but he was on the faculty, and he described the course. Now, uh, honestly, it really sounded to me like a lot of bulls called organizational psychology. His name, by the way, was David Kolb. David Kolb. And, <laughs> Um, and he said two words in his description that made me literally, not figuratively, run down to the basement where his class was so I could get in because they were all capacity controlled. I did get in. The two words were no tests. 
So <clears throat> sometimes the twist of fates rely on uh, various odd things. As a result of that and the fact that uh, in my first essay, I quoted from Ben Franklin's autobiography, which I'd read when I was 10 or 11 or something. And Kolb had just quoted that same passage in two papers he had submitted to journals. Um, he then asked me if I would work with some of his real data for my term paper instead of just writing a descriptive paper. He liked it, offered me a job for the summer, got me, introduced me to people like Ed Schein and Everett Hagen and um, Carl Swanson and Jack Pugh in the systems group, and then Dave McClelland. And all of a sudden, my senior year, I was finishing my degree, but also taking doctoral seminars. And that was when Dave uh, Kolb, in particular, Ed, and Ed had a key role too, ended up convincing me that I should go on to graduate school. And I, and I didn't know what came next, so they had to explain, you know, master's and doctorate. So they actually convinced me I should go to graduate school, convinced me I should go write for a doctorate, and convinced me I should go in psychology, I shouldn't go in management. And um, it made so much sense to me because by the time I hit December and was submitting some applications to graduate schools, I'd found a field that I loved. I didn't know anybody who would work, do what they were doing, whether they got paid or not. I mean, everybody I knew, my father, my uncles, they loved their work, but as soon as they could retire, they'd retire. Some would go back to the old country, some would stay here, but they would retire. I discovered a field that I wanted to do, which is helping people develop and change, whether I got paid or not. And that really was the transformative, um, that fall of 1967. Um, and then I got into the PhD program at, uh, at Harvard, and continued to work with people uh, that just kept kind of expanding my understanding of the basics of what to do. And so really focused on um, therapy. I was doing therapy with alcoholics and, and drug addicts, using all the same research and techniques and doing research on it. But I still had to pay for myself because there was a certain amount. Uh, I had to pay my way through school. Sure. And that's when I started doing training and consulting. So in 68, 69, all of a sudden I was doing training. I mean, I didn't know that much about it, but apparently uh, not too many people did. <laughs> <laughs> and as they say, uh, you know, you don't have to outrun the bear. You just have to outrun the other person you're with. Yeah. Um, and in this case, um, I was doing the training and consulting. Um, and paying my way through so that I continued, even when I was doing the clinical work, uh, to be doing a certain amount of consulting. And that, and that was really when um, the, the scientist in me, in working with McClellan in particular, um, so I was doing a lot on experiential learning theory with Kolb, who was creating the test at the right. time and the model. But he and I also worked on the early version of my intentional change theory in 67, 68, which we called self-directed change in those days. <clears throat> so that I was convinced of at all levels and, and had written papers in 70 and 71 on how to do this for organizations as well as teams as well as individuals. And really that's been my life's work is how do you help people change in sustainable ways at all these different levels. Thank you. So fast forwarding to you spent much of your career the last several years here at Case Western. And I want to talk a little bit now about, about your sure. work and your experience here. Um, when you think about about your time here at Case and, and all of the, the landmark work you, you've done, um, can you think of a time when you were particularly excited about the work and that you just knew that you were doing right. something groundbreaking and that you were doing something that was going to significantly impact people? A couple of months after I came in and, and I was brought in with tenure and <clears throat> the dean and associate dean had breakfast with me and asked me if I would uh, lead a program to really revolutionize what we were doing with the MBAs. <laughs> and it gave me an opportunity since I was one of the earliest people. I did my first competency study research in 1970, continued to work it. Um, and because my 82 book had come out as a research book, 
on linking competencies of managers to performance. Nobody else had ever published something like that before in terms of the research. Um, I was considered one of the founders of the competency movement in human resources and had been arguing for it throughout the 70s and 80s. So I, and had been doing outcome research uh, in my company, research company had, for the feds, NIE, FIPSI, since 74. And I personally had led several projects for the AACSB, the group that accredits management schools, in the late 70s, early 80s. So I got in and Scott Cowan and, and John Aram asked me if I would head up a committee to go to work on that whole issue. How can we develop people who'd be better managers and whole people, which really meant not the knowledge, because we assumed we were doing that, right. but the competencies and some of the values. And, and at first, I remember um, they asked if John would co-chair it with me because they were afraid um, coming out of consulting, I might be a too, too pushy for the, um, the faculty. Uh, w w soon they decided they didn't need to, and John just let me chair the committee, uh, and he went on to other deaning things um, because it was exciting. Although I had dabbled with this in creating an alternative in 1979 for the AMA to MBAs, this was a shot. And with Dave Kolb and Don Wolf and um, Bill Pasmore and Ron Fry and others who were uh, in the department at the time who had worked on competencies or aspects of them, to be able to create a set of activities, both courses and value orientations that could transform what an MBA meant mm -hmm. was important because the research data we had said that most MBAs were not worth the time. Right. You know, if you really want to learn how to manage people, go in the military, do babysitting for two years, anything would probably give you more um, skills in managing and leading other people than typical MBA programs. And that, that was transformative. Then in the early, meanwhile, Dave Kolb and I had been working on some life stage, career stage concepts. And in the early 90s, when people in, we were the most benchmarked MBA program mm -hmm. in the US uh, in the early 90s because of these innovations that we were doing. And um, what ended up happening is we started thinking about what happens to people not just the 30-year-old MBAs, but the executive MBAs around 40 and, and others. And um, I was making a, an argument with Dave to a lot of faculty that there were people throughout the lifespan who wanted to still learn. And the, at that point, the baby boomers were turning 40 and um, wanted to still learn. So we ended up creating, which was my second wow, a set of programs that went from 18 to 70. Um, and that's when we launched things like the professional fellows, the doctor of management, mm -hmm. to deal with folks around 50. And in the, and, but we outlined them in a series of papers about how they help people at different career and life stages. The MPOD being an example of an, an important program for people who were having their second midlife crisis and wanted to do something for others. Um, so that, in, in kind of, that really cemented it in. Um, the third real big one, that's why I, I've been here for 32 years. I mean, I keep having these phenomenal experiences with colleagues, was teaching a course on complexity theory mm -hmm. and dynamics in the engineering school with yeah. a geneticist and a systems yeah. engineer and a mathematician. And that was when I made the biggest leap in my intentional change theory that I'd done since 1970, when I'd been writing it up you know, for my doctoral program. And, and that's also when we, it became very clear uh, within a year or two that of all of the areas that we needed to understand, one was we needed to understand the mechanisms of why the ideal self or personal vision or shared vision in groups really was positive. And that led to a bunch of interactions in my neuroscience research. Mm -hmm. So hooking up with uh, some folks at the Cleveland Clinic and then Tony Jack here at Case led to the studies, the fMRI studies we've done now on different types of leadership, but also different types of coaching. At the same time, we were a number of doctoral students were interested in looking at the hormonal physiological effects. 
that stream. But then at the same time, it was um, helping us understand coaching, mm. which was what is it about certain of these relationships? I've, I haven't been involved in coaching since 1968, 69. Mm -hmm. We had one-on-one -on -one coaching as a part of all of our training programs. And, uh, and actually, I got to work with a former professor from Michigan, Walt Mahler, who had a coaching practices survey in 1970 and mm -hmm. used to teach it mm -hmm. in companies. So, I mean, so it's, it goes back a lot further than 1992. Yeah. Um, yeah. But... But it became very clear that it was certain types of relationships. And this is something that Dave Kolb and I had contended in the late 60s and um, in, in some publications in 70 and 71, that if you really wanted to effectively help someone, not just try to push them around or tell them what to do, you had to build a relationship. And that wasn't you. I mean, Carl Rogers had said it and others. But what kind of relationship? And it was clear that although empathy was key, that wasn't enough because a lot of people empathized right. and that's when the quality of the relationship became a key variable mm -hmm. so by uh 2014 we had 19 doctoral dissertations showing that shared vision was such a key variable it overwhelmed almost every other variable in predicting leadership effectiveness organization citizenship engagement and so forth so the idea that we use coaching as the place and, and the type of relationship where people can establish a shared sense of purpose, people can establish the caring and compassion that enables them to feel this is right, this is good. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so those are, and, and it continues. Um, you know, a few years ago, I, I'd always hated online learning. And a number of years ago, uh, the CIO, Lev Gonick, and the president of the university wanted to join with Coursera at the end of the first year that they were around with the MOOCs. And they asked me if I would do one along with Michael Scharf, who's now the co-dean at the law school, one of the first MOOCs. <clears throat> so I said, let me think about it. Unfortunately, they announced that I was doing it, so then I had to. <laughs> but, um, but I decided if I was going to do a MOOC and online, I wanted to see if I could get reach people in their heart and in their relationships. And up till then, most of the MOOCs had testing. Mm -hmm. So we, a number of people, Anita Howard, Ellen Van Osten, Angela Passarelli, and then Suzanne Healy here, worked cl closely with me to take the material and make it an inward experience. And then Steve Kupchnik from Media Vision did a phenomenal job of the, the filming and the editing. And we created a series of 11 minute videos and a program with exercises that the first run had 110,000 people in it, yeah. and which, you know, is just yeah. boggled my mind. And what was more important is when I watched their interactions on the discussion boards and the Facebook friends group and the Google Plus groups, I was moved by how much and how deep they were going in people changing their organizations, changing their management, changing their families um, by using it. So that's another example of what I think here has been very special, which is this deep um, commitment to innovation and a, a lot of very permeable boundaries across the university that allow us, any one of us who want to, to work with people. And I mean, I'm, in, I'm on the executive committee of the Brain Health Institute at, at the medical school. Uh, and. You know, I learn a lot about Alzheimer's and dementia and prion and Parkinson's, but uh, you know, I'm there in part because of the work on vision and the research that says if we can get more people to develop a personal sense of purpose, we get more people to establish a shared sense of purpose and shared vision with each other, get more people to act with compassion that we actually could delay onset of a lot of these horrendous diseases. So that's, that's what being here does. You've um, mentioned some very important things that you value about, about being a case. Um, the, uh, you talked about permeable boundaries. It sounds right. like you built deep relationships, but there also was a piece around um, 
you were you were allowed to be who you wanted to be and do the work that mattered. You were you were given space to do that. Is that is that is that fair or what else do you value? Oh no, that's uh, that's a very fair because now let let's be clear. I'm not creating this Pollyanna notion sure. because most of this work happens with no money at all. So I separate out the people who say, well, I'd like to do this, or there's this great opportunity, can you give me this budget? Um, you know, I, I come out of a world that says, if you need money, you go find it. And um, if you love what you're doing, why do you care about getting paid? Now, um, in doing the MOOCs, I didn't get paid anything. I did argue for a little bit of money for the doctoral students working with me at the time. And the media vision for folks got paid. but. Um, and, and we now can demonstrate how much money it brings into the school for a very low investment, but that's a part of the trade-off. So um, when you see, when I experience these opportunities, and that's a special thing about being in this department that's different than just being in the School of Management or at Case, we have a lot of colleagues who are equally excited about change and about doing things differently and about innovating. So it, it's an atmosphere where it's pretty easy to find a few <laughs> colleagues who, you know, are going to come together and kind of keep juicing each other up to go through it. Because even though I think the university is much more amenable to allowing you to do these things, it doesn't mean that you can get financial support from anybody. Exactly. So a lot of times you're doing the innovations uh, despite the institutional um, resource issues, but then at some point somebody says, wow, and then you're off and running. Thank you for that. Um, creating the future we hope for partly involves building on the best of the past, but it also involves dreaming about the future. Um, reflecting on, on the field that you've been in your whole life, um, what's your greatest hope for the future of the field? First, it's worth saying that I define the field a little bit differently. I mean, I'm not even sure OB, organization behavior, is a field. Mm -hmm. I think it's a practice, and you apply, uh, or I should say, I, it's a field, but it's not a discipline. Because I think the disciplines are psychology and right. mathematics and economics and all that. So even within organization behavior, what is it about organization development? I, and I pull all that together. Right. I mean, I, right. I, I define what I do as OD, OT, MD, PD, HRD, CD, et cetera, et cetera. If, if it has to do with helping people in our organizations, including families, change, right. Right. then I think it's our field. Okay, then that's how we're defining it. So I think the future um, looks pretty good because we have come a long way in the past 50 years. Uh, I just went to my 50th I MIT reunion yeah. and um, it's quite humbling <laughs> uh, because society has changed so dramatically in many ways and in other ways it hasn't. But in one of the ways is we now see the second generation millennials in addition to Gen Xers wanting a deeper sense of purpose mm. at work. Yes. They on the whole, according to the national and international surveys, they want a sense of purpose, which we call vision, um, meaning. They also want a more holistic life. So they're more interested in balancing. I mean, I'm a first year of the baby boomers, but because of immigrant parents and the rest of it and working class, I'm kind of pre-boomer. But I mean, I, you know, I grew up thinking that you basically worked to provide and you sacrificed everything, yeah. your health, your family, whatever, just to, for the family. People today are saying, you know, I don't want to live like my parents or my grandparents. I would like to actually notice my kids. Um, so having dinner with a colleague last night and two of his children, and I was telling him what a great father he is because, I mean, other than doing uh, chores around the yard on Saturday morning, I didn't interact much with my son when he was growing up. I, it was kind of, that was my wife's domain. And um, fortunately, she, being an elementary school teacher, understood that. But um, the, and, and the challenge, I think, has been to understand how to honor that. Mm -hmm. So I think we have now more people at work who want meaning, more people who want meaning in their avocational work. 
Uh, I think that just like psychotherapy is now not a horrible thing that people stay away from no matter what they do, the same thing with help. Uh, people are used to going to training programs. They're used to going back to school in some of our countries, um, the U.S. being North America, really, and the U.K., where at any age or stage, people will go back to school. And I, as I tell our 40 and 50 and 60-year-old students here, it's a much more functional way to deal with a midlife crisis right. than to buy a fancy sports car or take up skydiving um, or have affairs or whatever. But the whole idea is basically people look for opportunities to grow and develop. And that's, that's more of a norm now than it was. And now that we have, at least in this country, um, full virtual full employment, where there are so many more jobs than people looking for them, um, the problem is that on the whole, we're back to what McKinsey in 98 called the war for talent, which is how are organizations going to keep people and the number of, by young, at <laughs> my age, by young, I'm talking about 30-year-olds, how, how are organizations going to keep young people? Well, a lot of people today don't want to work for large organizations. You know, okay. you work for a consulting company of a small group of committed professionals. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are doing that now. Yeah. And they're leaving jobs when things don't satisfy them in certain ways and they say, okay, I'll start my own company, I'll start my own business. Mm -hmm. And we now have, now that we're fully out of that horrible recession from a few years back, uh, we now have an economy that sustains that, that level of opportunity. And that means that people are looking for novelty. Mm -hmm. They're looking for growth. Well, you know, we help to provide a certain amount of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that the kind of techniques we're using have come a long way. I mean, we've come a long way from the old tea groups where you sit around and, you know, feel the floor with your toes um, to saying what we're doing in these workshops shouldn't just blow your mind, uh, although I do think the 70s are coming back in many ways uh, with all these protest marchers and the legalization of marijuana. Uh, and, and there's some, there could be some fun things in that, but uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> <laughs> this is a flashback. But, uh, but, but I think uh, part of what it, it suggests is that people are looking for adventure, but with meaning. Mm -hmm. People are more likely today to figure out or ask whether or not what they're doing is contributing to society. Uh, mm -hmm. People are more likely to create portfolios where in the work they're doing, they are emotionally engaged in the philanthropic activities. They're not just donating money, they're donating their time and their energy. Uh, and, and now as people are thinking about working till they're 75, 80, 85, uh, the whole concept is most people aren't going to continue working maybe for money, maybe not but they'll continue doing a variety of things in what's now called a portfolio. That creates a tremendous opportunity to contribute, to have novelty, and to keep growing. Yeah. And that's where we come in. I, I mean, I think yeah. whether as coaches or as OD consultants or as trainers, we create opportunities for people to explore what they want to do and how they want to liberate their energy and their dreams to be able to contribute, to be able to innovate, to be able to create beauty and kindness. That's great. You got very energized when you just answered that question. Yeah, so, well, that's exciting. You know, that's exciting. Yeah. It's very exciting. And so, so finally, um, as, you, as you reflect on all of your time here, um, our conversation this morning, how would you like to be remembered and how would you like your work to be remembered? Sounds a little weird, but I, I, I think I'd like to be remembered personally as somebody who people felt was really cared about them as individuals and made them laugh. Uh, I, I think that's a key part of our relationships. In terms of, of my work, um, I, although I am most known from the competency work, which these days we call emotional intelligence, I would say all of that, e even when I was doing the work on the competencies and the emotional intelligence, and still am, it's in the context of how do we use it to create better relationships, better organizations, better families, and so forth. So the, the part that I'm really continuing to chase is how to help people 
and, and right now I'm using the elements of my intentional change theory, but um, that's the part of it. Uh, how to help people build better relationships, how to help people um, make their human systems, their families, their organizations be lively places where people feel like they can not just be who they want to be, but they can be someone who is caring, who has a sense of purpose. Uh, if, if that happens, then I'll feel like the people who are carrying on this work uh, are continuing to do things that we were meant to do by whatever God or supernatural forces we pray to. Thank you for that. And thank you for your conversation this morning. It was very, very enlightening. And I'm sure people will enjoy um, hearing your thoughts. And with that, I'd thank like you, to Laura. say thank you.